Hi, my name is Doreen, and welcome to today's Legal Tech Association event from Big Law Partner to former General Counsel of Apple. Bruce Sewell shares insights into a legal career spanning 30 years. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted online on a YouTube channel called Before You Take the LSAT, if anyone is interested in seeing the recording. Um, today we are honored to host Mr. Bruce Sewell, who is very humbly mentioned that we can just call him Bruce. Yes, please do. <laughs> Um, by way of introduction, Bruce has had an illustrious career spanning 30 years. He has worked at three law firms, ranging uh, from roles in, as an associate to a big law partner at a lit litigation firm, to serving in the role of general counsel at two multinational technology companies, Intel and Apple. Bruce has had an interesting path in that he had never wanted to be a lawyer. He grew up in England, earning his undergrad degree in clinical psychology, and always assumed that he would attend med school. After undergrad, he moved to America and worked as a fireman in Maryland. He received unexpected news in 1982. GW University offered to pay Bruce's tuition for his postgraduate degree. He immediately filed an application for med school, only to find out that they meant any degree except for medicine, which was deemed too expensive. <laughs> Bruce decided to ask the school what their second most expensive degree was, to which they, <laughs> to which they replied, law, and here we are today. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Bruce, so much sure. for taking the time to talk to us today. We are honored to have you and truly appreciate your time. I'm so happy to be here. Can you all hear me? I'll try to talk loud. Too. All right, so just to get started, because you did have a path where you weren't intending originally to go into law, I'm just curious what qualities you see in yourself that you think made you successful no matter what career path you chose. I, I think I have a capacity for being relatively calm in a crisis. I don't tend to get too wrapped up in um, in things, and I think that's a sort of useful. It's it's useful to be able to stay calm, to remove yourself from some of the stress of things, uh, particularly when you're trying to lead an organization or you're trying to lead a team, in in a time where people are under a lot of stress. There's a um, a crisis, and we, we were talking this morning in a different context about leading through crises and how when you're in a really tough situation, when you're in a crisis, several things start to happen. Um, the first is that the, the time scale compresses. Everything happens quickly and everything seems like it has to happen at once. Things get, certain things get sort of disproportionately important in a crisis. It seems like every decision is a make or break decision. And so that combination of, of a lot of stress and noise and um, compressed time frame and disproportionate importance, all of those things make for bad decision making. And if you can find a way to sort of step back from that, keep your head, be level-headed, um, I, I think that's a capacity that I have and maybe something that's been useful. Also, I'm just curious, the people who are here, how many of you are one L's? Two L's? Three L's? <laughs> <laughs> An LLM's? Whoa, wow. my goodness, all right. That's actually very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, you have previ previously said that the key to doing a successful job as a general counsel is, to be, is the ability to be a business person, and I'm just, I'm just curious if you could expand on that, and like, what do you mean by business person? Yeah, I, I don't mean to suggest that general counsels ought to be um, product managers or they ought to run big parts of the corporation. What I'm getting at really is that in the corporate context, more than in a law firm context or a government role, your job has to do with making decisions that are inherently both legal and business related. Uh, if you are simply acting as a lawyer, then your training and most of the things for which you are rewarded in law school and in firm practice have to do with avoiding risk, minimizing risk. Um, counseling to to reduce risk whereas a business person again by training and by necessity in the corporate context is really trying to manage risk not reduce it but but essentially embrace it and figure out how do you how do you optimize in a risk environment and it's a very different way of thinking about things. N neither one is, is uniquely good or bad, but they're just different. And as a lawyer in a corporation, 
your ability to be sympathetic to and to respond to that approach of, I'm not trying to eradicate risk, I'm trying to manage risk, I'm trying to use risk as my friend, if you will, um, is a unique skill and it, it requires lawyers to do something that they're not generally trained to do. So that's what I meant by, by thinking like a business person, understanding that you're in a risk profile and you want to kind of optimize for that. So on the topic of being a GC at a huge multinational tech company, I'm just curious, what was it like to manage 900 people? <laughs> not that, you know, not all of them were lawyers, but it was right. a legal department of 900 people. I'm just curious what that looked like. Well, you know, it, it doesn't feel, in most cases, like you're actually managing 900 people. Because the way that any organization is set up, there are, there are levels within the organization. And from my vantage, I dealt mainly with 10 people. And, and those 10 people, in turn, um, manage the team of people. And so it, it actually feels quite manageable. It doesn't feel like 900 people, except for the occasions where we would do um, a, a department offsite, where we'd all get together maybe once or twice uh, a year and everybody, all 900 people would be there and so it would seem sort of, sort of big, but um, generally, you know, when you're managing a team like that, you take it in, in bite-sized pieces and, and my role primarily was to try to set direction, provide some sort of strategic compass, if you will, to the, to the group, and then be an immediate mentor and supervisor to the 10 people who worked directly for me and then they would carry that message and they would hopefully role model the same characteristics that I wanted the department to exhibit. They would role model those and push them down in the organization. I'm curious between the um, legal department that you worked with and the executive board that you were on, mm -hmm. how, how did your time split between the two? So as a general counsel, I probably spent more time interacting with senior executives at the company than with the legal department generally. Um, that would change according to what was topical at the time. So, um, for example, um, many of you may recall some of the smartphone wars when, when Apple was at the center of a very protracted and very complex set of patent cases involving Samsung, Motorola, Google. Um, in, in an instant like that, for the year or so that that was, that was going on, I probably was, was focused more on the legal side. Uh, by contrast, you know, probably the most intense couple of months that I ever spent at the company were during the time when Apple was litigating with the FBI over access to um, Saeed Farouk's phone. This is the, the San Bernardino bomber. Um, during that period of time, I was almost entirely locked down with the GC, uh, sorry, with the CEO and the head of, of public affairs, basically our, our PR people, um, and not doing a whole lot on the legal side. We had great outside counsel, and I have at Apple one of the most incredible directors of litigation that, that any company has the privilege to employ. She's just incredible. And so I could leave that stuff to her. And I was really focused on talking to the media, talking to Congress, talking to the White House, that kind of stuff. I think an interesting thing to note about your path is, and your past is also that you've worked with Apple in multiple different areas, right? You've worked <coughs> as an outside counsel for Correct. them, you've worked negotiating against them, and you've also obviously worked with inside counsel. Yeah. Um, my question is, what? I know that there is no typical day, but if you had to explain kind of what the responsibilities look like in a day-to-day -day sense, or I know you've mentioned in the past that you spent about 35% of your time traveling. At least, yeah. At least. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd just be curious to hear what your day-to-day -day looks like and what the balance, how you make sure that it's balanced and meaningful and not <laughs> overwhelming. Well, one of the problems with being a general counsel of a company like Intel is that you really don't have a typical day, right? I mean, you, yeah. you, you're reacting to stuff that happens in real time, and so yeah. you don't really know. But um, a, a sort of routine day for me would be, uh, it starts early. And the reason it started early at Apple is because <coughs> my, my sort of principal focus at, at Apple is Tim, right? it's the CEO. It's, it's sort of, it's what's going on in his life that largely dictates how I spend my time. 
if Tim's out of the picture, then, then I can sort of control my own schedule. But if Tim needs me, then that's going to take priority. We call this sort of a priority interrupt. No matter what else is going on, if Tim needs me, then that's where I have to be. And Tim is a little crazy in his work <laughs> schedule. He gets up around 4 o'clock in the morning, and then he's in the gym by 5.30, and he's in the office by about 7.30. But so from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m., there's a, there's a lot of activity. So my first thing when I got up around 6.30 a.m. would be to check my email and see all the stuff that Tim had left for me, the little cookies that he's left for me from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. Um, but I would, so I'd, I'd deal with the, a, any immediate problem, something that had to be dealt with immediately, I'd do first thing. Then I'd try to get in the office by about, probably about 8 o'clock. And um, the way that Apple's organized, and this is true at Intel as well, uh, General councils have two offices more often than not. So you have an office in the C-suite. Uh, in the case of, of Apple, the offices went uh, Steve originally, then Tim, then the CFO, then me, sort of going around the corner. And um, that's really useful if you need to talk to your CEO immediately or just the fact that people had their doors open a lot of times you hear things and could come out in the corridor and sort of get in the middle of conversations. But then I also have an office at the legal department, so in the, in the law department itself, which is in another building. So I'd usually start the day going into the C-suite, check in with people, get, a, get online, see what was going on. Um, there might be some sort of project that had carried over from the day before. Um, and I would usually work in the C-suite until about noon or one o'clock and then tried to get over to the legal department, if I could, at least three or four days a week and spend an afternoon there um, checking in with people. But as you said correctly, I was probably traveling 30 or 40 percent of the time. So the vast majority of my days weren't that orderly and weren't that sort of placid. It was um, jumping on planes, meeting with people, um, and, and often having projects that were very sort of long-term projects. So. Uh, what, you know, let's see, uh, the Google negotiation, for example, between Apple and Google over search probably took us four months, meeting almost every single day <laughs> with, um, with Sacha, who was running, the, um, uh, you know, running Google at the time, and Kent Walker, who's the Google general counsel, and then with myself and either um, Tim or uh, Eddie Q, who was the, the, my counterpart on that deal. So we'd be at, at Google or they'd be at Apple almost every day. I mean, it's just one example. There are a lot of those kinds of negotiations or lawsuits that just completely suck up all your time. Do you think that you enjoyed the aspect of not having a routine? And do you think that it's possible to be successful as a GC if you, don't, if you do like having a routine? Hmm. So I'm not a routine kind of guy. I, I don't like having a routine. And to me, the excitement of a job like uh, GC at Intel or GC at Apple is, is that you're constantly reacting to things. You're constantly responding. Everything is happening in a very short time frame. So, so I prefer that. And that's definitely the milieu in which I am more comfortable. Could you have a, a more routine job as a general counsel? I, I think it's possible. But I also think you'd miss a lot. Mm -hmm. You could set up the department so that you really just managed. And, and managing tends to be a more predictable way to spend your time. To me, that would be really boring. <laughs> I, I, because if you're managing, then sort of by definition, you're not actually getting involved in the case. You're not arguing the case. You're not writing the brief. You're not testifying in front of Congress. You're managing other people who are doing that. And that would be boring to me. But, but I think you could. I think you could do that. It's also interesting that I think there's been a sea change in the way large corporations think about their general counsel over the last 10 or 15 years. And the reason it's relevant to this discussion is that I think if you look back 10, 15 years ago, it was not at all uncommon for big corporations to go to big law when they needed a general counsel and pull a partner who was probably in the corporate group. So someone whose practice had been representing companies in front of the SEC, 
making sure that the corporate formalities were, were appropriately observed. Um, and, and that person's job was really to sort of run the, the administrative side of the corporation and to be a functional legal rep inside the company. I think that's changed dramatically now. And if you look at the people that are being hired by major law, uh, major corporations as general counsel now, they're often litigators. They're often people who've spent time um, doing international transactions or doing intellectual property. Uh, and the corporate side of things has been more often than not outsourced. There's, there'll be somebody who's like the the corporate director inside the corporation, but they're working mainly with outside counsel to do that work. And the real, the sort of day-to-day nitty-gritty representation of the company and defense of the company is more often done by litigators and by people who have a different set of skills. I also want to mention that um, even though we will have time for questions at the end, if people have questions throughout that are relevant yeah, to what yeah. we're <laughs> feel yeah, feel free to, to raise your hand and, and we can have questions throughout. It could be more interactive if anybody does want to yeah, please. contribute. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit, as you transitioned um, from Brown and Bain to Intel and then from Intel to Apple, mm -hmm. or just even just generally in your career path, what were some of your greatest challenges and how did you overcome them? Uh, so the move from Brown and Bain to Intel was shocking in a lot of ways because I really I'd come from a very sort of traditional law firm environment and was thrown into what was a very organized and very well run corporate environment, but they're radically different. Yeah. And um, one of the most important differences we've already talked about that sense of learning how not to think like a lawyer in every case, but learning how to apply your legal skills and your legal knowledge in this context of thinking like a business person. So that's a, that's a hard transition to make uh, the first time you try it. The other thing that's, that's difficult, I think, the first time you make that move, and this sounds sort of simplistic, but in a law department as a lawyer, you're it. You're the product. You're what the whole company is about. And so everything in a law firm is focused on making the lawyer as successful as possible. So, so you're sort of like, you're, you're the, the person in a law firm, uh, particularly if you're a partner. In a corporation, you're not the thing at all. The thing is something completely different. You're part of a much bigger, broader team. You're one piece of a larger puzzle that is all geared towards selling microprocessors or selling iPhones. And so that, that psychological shift from, from being the thing which is at the center of the enterprise to being something which is important but, but very much a part of a larger picture in the enterprise is a very different way of thinking about things. So, so that was an important shift as well. Um, going from Intel to Apple, in some cases with like going from university to kindergarten, I guess, but because uh, Apple's just this wild place. Apple's a very different from a the sense of a of management, even though the business and the company is is among the most sophisticated in the world. But the the um, atmosphere at Intel was very formal. The atmosphere at Apple is very creative, very laissez-faire. Um, and so there's this, this sense of order leading to the good result at Intel and kind of chaos leading to an incredible result at Apple. Uh, and so it was a very different environment. The thing that was the most difficult for me at Apple was at Intel I came in at a sort of mid-level. I was a partner in a law firm three years in as a partner and, and made the bounce to, to Intel. So I did not go in as general counsel of Intel. I was at Intel for about six years before I became general counsel. As a result of those six, six years, I, I grew up with a peer set that were also moving up the corporate ladder at the same time that I was. So by the time I became general counsel, I had really good contacts in the organization. People that I'd worked with that were peers of mine as a director, as a vice president, and then as a senior vice president. When I came into Apple, I came directly in as general counsel and as a senior vice president. And so I didn't have that depth of knowledge. I didn't know 
who deep in the company you called when you needed an answer to a particular kind of question. And so the first six months or a year that I was at Apple, I spent a lot of time trying to meet people and develop relationships with people other than just the nine other members of the executive team. Apple's, Apple's run by 10 people, essentially, um, one of whom is the CEO. So at first it was Steve, and then it became Tim. And that executive team really um, work as a, as a unit, and they work very closely <laughs> together. But not knowing the people below that meant that I would, it would take me longer to find out information, and I would have to um, create relationships that I could rely on. Whereas when I took over at Intel, those relationships already existed. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about how much uh, the corporate structure influences in your operation as the general counsel, and then kind of vice versa, how your operation is able to shift the, uh, the corporate structure and governance? So uh, corporate structure has a big impact on the structure of the legal department. There are certain kinds of functions that, that have to exist in a legal department, and they map against needs that the corporation has. So normally, we think about corporate structure as a, as a matrix. Um, and there are sort of vertical pillars in, in that organizational structure. Those pillars are generally business units that are responsible for a product or a suite of products. They're um, P&Ls, so they run on a profit and loss basis. Um, they are then supported by the sort of horizontal slats in the organization, which are functions that cut across those P&Ls, like marketing, sales, legal, finance, HR. And so you have this sort of matrix of things. Well, that's the way most companies are set up, and then legal departments have to reflect that as well. So I would have to have a bunch of what we call business attorneys, people who are directly responsible for maintaining and supporting those vertical columns. And then I would have a series of, of specialists, either litigators, intellectual property attorneys, uh, tax attorneys, stuff like that. So, so the structure of the company does largely dictate the structure of the law firm. Um, and it's also true, I think, that the culture of the company is, is important to the culture of the law department. Um, Apple has a, a very strong culture. I, Intel did too, but Apple's is more externally facing because Apple's a consumer company, which Intel never was. Um, Apple has a brand that I think most of you would recognize is a is a particularly powerful brand, and it's it's it, it has a lot of connotations and a lot of um, of power in the marketplace. So as a result, the the legal team needs to be consistent with that brand. There would be times when um, when I was communicating externally that that my closest colleague would be PR. Because the issue was, yes, OK, you're communicating on a legal matter. But we want to make sure that even the legal communication is consistent with the culture and the image that the company wants to portray. Because even legal things that come out of Apple will get read and dissected and analyzed. So there's a, a real feeling of wanting to be consistent. The reverse of that, the extent to which the legal team can influence the culture, I think is more subtle, but there, there is a sort of two ways of looking at it. There's a space that is principally in the compliance, uh, in the ethics, in the legality kind of um, the, the way in which the corporation acts in those spheres where legal has a very important role, not just in representing the company and defending the company, but in setting the tone for the company. And that, I think, is a, is a critical role. It's one that the general counsel largely is responsible for, but in close concert with the CEO. And it's the thing that you we use this ter term tone at the top. Um, and I think that's an incredibly important part of the relationship between the general counsel and the CEO, to set that tone, to role model the, the, the cultural things that you want the company to reflect. Um, beyond that, there's also the ability, certainly to, in any given point, advocate for and articulate reasons why the company should take a position or not take a position. It's critically important in what a general counsel does, and it gives you an opportunity to move the company in different directions. Your ability to be successful at that depends 
largely on some of the stuff we've already talked about, your ability to gain the trust of the business people, your ability to be able to talk to the business people using the same kind of nomenclature and language that they understand. Um, but there's, there's so, so the answer is there's lots of different things that the, the corporation is, influences the law department. Law department is also capable of influencing the corporation. Uh, yeah, sure. You said before that you have uh, a team of specialized people did you externalize some of the activities to law firms? And how did you decide to uh, manage that distribution between internal activities and external? Yeah, it's a great question and, and probably a complicated answer. And it's also evolved a lot over time. 25 years ago, the default condition within a corporation was essentially to move all of the legal work outside. And the law department would tend to be fairly small and, and really functionary. They would be the interface between the corporation and the law firm, but, but that's about the only role of, of in-house counsel. That's changed radically in the last 25 years. And more and more large international corporations are building small law firms within their own um, sort of border. So the, as Doreen mentioned, I had 900 people that worked for me. About 600 of them were in the law group. And so most of them were lawyers, but also paralegals and, and other kinds of, of um, you know, sort of legal professionals. The decision of, of what you move and when you move it, it depends a little bit. In, in some places, for example, litigation, you can't staff an internal department to handle large pieces of litigation. In the seminar that I teach, we went through this, the, the one of the Samsung cases. And um, in one of the Samsung cases, we had 350, this is just one, and there were seven of them going on. We had 350 people billing time on that case at any given moment. Uh, most of them were outside counsel. Uh, we had, I think it was seven or eight million documents that were produced that had to be reviewed. Um, the law firms collectively, I think, billed us 280,000 hours so you can't, you can't have a legal department that is staffed to handle that kind of spike in demand. So most litigation is managed internally, but the work is done by outside counsel. And ideally, the best relationship is that you're the team leader inside and the senior partner on the outside are, are working just you know, hand in glove. And, and they really manage the case. By contrast, things like um, intellectual property, maintaining the IP portfolio, doing a lot of the patent prosecution, um, handling a lot of the licensing, is I think more efficiently handled by people who are experts internally, who not only have the skills to do the licensing, but also have the knowledge of what's at the core of the corporation's needs in this space. What is it that's really important to the business people? What kinds of rights do they need in order to be able to do the kinds of work that they want to do? That's hard to communicate to outside counsel, and it's much easier for in-house to do that. So, um, you know, the reality is that now, with 600 people in my department, it's like a mid-sized law firm. Um, but we still would spend, um, you know, my budget was just shy of a billion dollars a year, and a lot of that would go on outside law firms uh, because of the litigation and because of um, internationally. There's, there's also, we would have, we had people spread out all over the country, but the particular group in London, for example, would be responsible for a lot of Europe, and if we had a, pr a problem in Spain, then we'd need local counsel in Spain, so we'd go and get outside counsel in Spain, and that would be true anywhere in the world. So the, the international bills um, were probably a little bit heavier on outside counsel, but the biggest, biggest portion was certainly litigation. Yeah. So Appleseam is really uh, you know, defined by Um, so, it is just absolutely undeniably true that, that Apple, from day one and, and even today, still reflects a lot of Steve's DNA 
and, and it's, I think, magnificent that that's true. Tim has, has tried to stay as faithful to sort of the, the vision that Steve has as, as he can. Um, but the company has also evolved in ways that differentiate it from, from the time when Steve was running the company. It's, it's probably more engaged in society now than it was before. It's more engaged in issues like human rights, the environment, cultural issues um, than it was under Steve's uh, guidance. But, but the core values, that, that sense of perfection, that sense of producing the very best thing that you can and, and then putting it out in the world with the hope that if it's the best thing that you can do, other people will find it good too. As opposed to, um, I'm going to figure out what everybody wants and then try to build something that looks like what they want. Apple's philosophy has always been sort of the, the converse of that. We're going to build the best thing that we can and then hope that it's what, what other people want. But it's going to be what satisf satisfies us <coughs> first and foremost. And that's remained a part of the, the corporate culture. Um, the, the kind of dedication to excellence, the, the focus on just being smart and, and as Steve would say, wicked smart is also a, a part of the corporate culture. How much that bleeds into the law firm? Um, I, I think the law department, as we said before, always reflects the corporation. And so the same kinds of characteristics, attention to detail, um, striving to do your best, um, those things are part of the law culture as well at Apple. Yeah. Wow. Sure. Yeah. Um, at what point in your career did you know that you wanted to go in-house? <laughs> and what, like, how, how would you reflect on your decision-making process? How did you want to go? Yeah, so, so uh, the reason I laugh is because the in-house decision was a little like the law school decision. <laughs> um, I was at a firm, Brown and & Bain, and the... Palo Alto office was going through a, a churn. A lot of partners were leaving. There was some discussion about whether we were going to close that office. And the reason they were leaving is because the, um, the Palo Alto office represented about 25% of the partners in the firm, but contributed about 80% of the profit of the firm. And um, there was a, a sort of you know, a little mini revolt by the partners in Palo Alto against the larger partnership in Phoenix saying, you know, we either want to be compensated more appropriately for the amount of revenue we're bringing in and blah, blah, blah. So there was a sort of fracture in the firm. And um, I was a third year partner and looked at the course of the future if I stayed at the firm, stayed at, at Brown and Bain or, or went to Perkins. Um, and, and to me, it appeared that uh, as this fracture is occurring, the likelihood would be that I would have to spend even more time than I was already spending developing business. Because a lot of the partners were leaving and they were going to take clients with them. And so instead of being a litigation partner and trying cases, I was going to spend a lot more time whining and dining with clients and, and doing the kind of rainmaking stuff, which um, didn't do a whole lot for me. And, and it was, there wasn't going to get any relief from the litigation. This was just going to be on top of it. So. Um, I sort of stepped back and said, uh, which partners are successful in this big law context um, that don't spend a whole lot of time doing that kind of rainmaking stuff? And it occurred to me that um, there's sort of a shortcut around that, and it is if you can ally yourself with one big major client, a company like Intel or Apple spins off hundreds of millions of dollars of legal work every year, and it's a consistent flow of, of money. So if you can be a partner at a law firm and you're sort of tapped into that because you have a special relationship with the corporation, then that's a pretty successful way to be in a law firm. So my whole thought was I'm going to go to Intel for a couple or three years and sort of get to know the company, develop a special relationship, be known by the general counsel, and then I'm going to go back out into the law world and, um, and be a successful partner. Of course, I got to Intel had loved it and never never left the corporate side, but originally it was it was the sense was that um, that's what I would do. I actually was Tom Dunlap, who was the general counsel of Intel, approached me at exactly this time, and Intel was looking for a director of litigation, and so Tom and I tried a couple of cases together, and he knew me well. He said, "Would you consider coming in house to take over the litigation function?" 
my response to him was, funny you should mention that, Tom. I'm just thinking about making the move in-house, but I'd really rather not litigate because I kind of know how to do that. It's something that I've been doing for a long time. What I'd much rather do is come in-house and learn the transactional side of law in a corporation, how to do licensing, how to negotiate contracts, how to support a business unit. And, and Tom very generously said, okay, you don't have those skills, but I know you, and I think you're probably smart enough to figure it out. So they brought me in as a transactional lawyer, um, which then obviously was sort of one of those things where you get in and go, ah, this, is, this is really cool, and, and then I didn't leave. So a lot of the things that you mentioned really resonate with me. I started my career with the IT multinational in India. And I often found that the only time that they actually cared about lawyers was when they were in trouble. Yeah. Um, and I was on the transactional side of things. So I think one of my biggest struggles was it, I found it much easier to actually negotiate a contract with a lawyer on the other side. But before getting there, uh, you had to first kind of convince internal stakeholders who were business people. Right. Um, and I mean, like you said, we're kind of trained to be risk averse, so everything uh, could be a possible red flag. So my question is that, especially as someone who's starting out on the transactional side of things, um, how do you kind of take a call on what is uh, good to have versus what is a must have? Because I mean, everything could be a risk. So when, you know, like how, how can you tell when something is a tangible risk versus something which is just not people? So when you're a, a brand new lawyer, it's, it's harder to know that. I think one of the things that you get as a more experienced lawyer is the sense of when something's really important and when something isn't. Um, and as a, as a brand new lawyer, it's probably better from a career perspective to try to spot the things that are risks and then maybe get somebody else to help you figure out how to prioritize their importance. But ultimately, the place that you want to get to is uh, not so much recognizing what is real risk and what isn't risk, but actually one stage beyond that. You want to get to the point where you can use risk as a competitive advantage. That's the point at which law actually becomes a commercial asset to the company. If, if you can figure out how to get closer to a particular risk, but be prepared to manage it if it does go nuclear, then your company, think of it as a sailing metaphor, your company is able to sail closer to the wind than its competitors are. And that's a real advantage. And so what you're trying to do as a lawyer in-house, as a transactional lawyer, is, is not only know the stuff that you don't need to pay attention to, but be laser focused on the stuff that, that could become really problematic and figure out through a combination of experience, of um, creating contingency plans, of being prepared to react if something goes wrong, but to steer the ship as close as you can to that line, because that's where the competitive advantage occurs. Um, but I, I, I'm, it's, it's hard to say exactly where that line is, and that's something that you just develop over time. And you have to have the permission of the company to do that, because every so often, you're going to get it wrong. Apple got involved in a very ugly suit with the US government here in the Southern District of New York that had to do with um, our release of the iBook store. And that was an opportunity where, or an example of where I tried to chart a course that I thought was incredibly good for Apple um, and, and would bear legal scrutiny. There were some things that were going on amongst a group of publishers that I didn't know about. If I had known about them, I would have taken a different tack, forgive the metaphor. Um, but, but that was an example of, of sailing as close to the wind because it was so important to Apple. But in the end, I got it wrong. And Apple ended up being sued by the government and um, ended up having to pay a large fine. The reaction from Tim was, you, that's the right choice. Right? I mean, we, we all, you made the best choice that you could with the information that you had. You didn't know about these other things. Don't let that scare you. I don't want you to stop pushing the envelope because that's why Legal is an important function in the company. Uh, 
Um, <coughs> you spoke a lot about how you have to deal with a lot of people, and there's so much there's so much like elements of business and what you've had to do. Um, I have a two part question. The first part is what drew you to business, and, and you've mentioned that you've liked business, law, and economics. Um, what drew you to business and those two other fields as well, like to begin with, and um, do you think that your background, having studied psychology, was helpful in the fact that you had to deal with people so much? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems to me that's two sides of the same coin. Um, I, I like interacting with people. I like negotiating with people, talking to people, um, which is in part what led me to psychology, uh, and in part, I think, that same um, trait or characteristic made in-house practice of law and made the sort of law business <coughs> interface more attractive to me. Um, I think that's, yeah, so, so that's, what, that's what sort of drew me there. There are lots of people who go into law and go into corporate law who have a different perspective, who think about these things differently. Like you, there are some general counselors who really just want to be administrators and they, they don't want to be in the thick of it. But I mean, you could even trace this further as a litigator. I mean, that's, you're sort of, you're, you're talking to people, you're persuading people, you're trying to articulate things to people that you think are important and you want them to subscribe to the same belief. So, so all of that is sort of a piece of the same puzzle. I just want to see how much time we have left. We have about 10 minutes before I think people have to start heading out. Sure. Um, go ahead. Could you reflect on what you think are the different challenges of going in house from Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't think that there's a better, one's not better than the other. They're, they're different. And it depends in some respects what you really think your career is going to be. And by that, what I mean is that if you go in-house as a litigator, it's going to be probably easier to move around within the corporate environment. And that's because litigation has a sort of foundational set of skills. Um, identifying risk, being prepared to deal with risk, understanding um, how conflict gets resolved, which is fairly generally applicable to many things that you do in the corporate context. If you go in as a transactional lawyer, you will have opportunities to probably step over into the business space that don't exist for other people in the legal department, but you probably won't have a lot of opportunities to move around within the legal department. So if you go in as a litigator and you want to become a transactional lawyer, that's not a hard step to make. If you go in as a transactional lawyer and you want to become a litigator, that's a difficult path to follow. But if you come in as a transactional lawyer, um, certainly some relatively small portion of people that come in that way ultimately end up on the business side. Right? So they're supporting a business unit. They learn a lot about that business unit. And the, the general manager of that unit says, you know, why don't you come work for me? Because I think you're really good at what you do. And so um, that exists as you're a if you're a transactional lawyer. If you want to be a GC, I don't think that there's one or the other that's better or worse. It's just that your path will look a little different. But if you want to be a GC, the idea is to get as much exposure as you can to do a really good job at the various tasks that you do and, and get noticed by the company. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you're a litigator or a transactional lawyer. Mr. Buckland. As opposed to going in at the level you did, yeah. what are the opportunities and at what point a starting lawyer or a dual lawyer consider or be considered uh, going in-house? In yeah, as most of you probably know, the, the, the general principle is that corporations don't hire right out of law school. And th the reason for that has always been that corporations aren't set up to train lawyers, where law firms are very much set up to train junior lawyers. The way we talk about this in the seminar is that, that one of the differences between being a lawyer in, in house and being a lawyer in a firm is that in a firm there's there's an expectation that as a junior lawyer you're learning your craft and you're you're advancing your skills. When you go in house, 
you are an expert from day one, the first day you get in there and sit down at the business table with the general manager of the unit that you're supporting, you're the legal expert. There's no, well, I'm a first year, I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. You're there because you're the legal expert. So on day one, you have to be um, completely proficient. So corporations usually almost inevitably wait until people have a little more experience. The sweet spot, I think, is about three to five years. Um, and then the next sweet spot is that kind of 10 to 11 year, so junior partner space. But for associates, between three and five years is sort of the ideal time. Because from a corporate standpoint, you've now learned the basic nuts and bolts, the skills of whatever practice area you've decided to pursue. Um, but you're still sort of, of um, young enough in your career that you can learn how to do it the Intel way or learn how to do it the Apple way. Uh, and so that's sort of an ideal, an ideal place to go. I have two questions that I want to ask you before we finish, so I'm going to try to do it quickly. So we focused a lot on the beginning of a career, like how you start going into in-house or something like that. But I'm curious, what does it look like at the end of yeah. your career when you decide that, how do you decide that this is the right time to retire or finish? I'm sure it's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, for, in, in my case, it was kind of a series of things. I had been doing the general counsel thing for eight years at Intel and eight years at Apple, and almost nine years, so 16, 17 years as a general counsel. And um, while I loved it, more and more of what I was doing in the later part of my career was, was really business advice. It wasn't practicing law, it was doing business things. And um, I, I really enjoyed that part of it. I, I also was absolutely blessed through, through no particular skill on my part to be in a position by 58, 59 that I could retire, that I, it was no longer an issue of, of having enough money. Um, my wife kind of said, look, you know, why are we doing this? If, if, if we don't need the money, um, why not do something else? And so it was a kind of a, a coincidence of recognizing that I didn't need to continue to be a GC and thinking if I stop at 58, 59, 60, then, then there are a lot of other things I can do with my life for the next 20 years. Um, that if I continue to work until I'm 70, I probably won't have those same options. So it just, it was, it came to a, a reasonable point at which um, I, I remember sending a note to Tim saying, you know, I, I, I think we sort of reached the point where uh, this time, by this time next year, you should have somebody else in place. Um, he didn't respond for like five days. Oh. And I was just <laughs> like, oh my God, what's going to throw me out? And then he sent me the, the most beautiful note. He said, sorry it took me so long to respond, but I kept thinking it was a nightmare and I was going to wake up from it. And um, So it took us 18 months to find my, my successor. And so I ended up staying a little bit longer than I had intended, but, but for very good reasons. And we ended up with an amazing person at Apple. Just, again, war stories, but when Tim and I sat down the first time to talk about finding my replacement, he said, we're going to go with an outside firm. Spencer Stewart will be our headhunting firm. But I want you to um, give them a head start because you know the industry better than any of us. So, so who are the people that you think would be great? And, you know, give us, give me a list and give Spencer a list of like your top five or seven candidates, whatever. So I wrote down a list with seven names on it. The very top name was Kate, and Kate's the person who ultimately got the job. It took us 18 months to get there, but from day one, I thought she was the perfect pick, and in the end, we got, we got to that point. Um, also, another question that I wanted to ask you is, do you feel like you've achieved your life goal? <laughs> I hope not, no. <laughs> um, Maybe at least professionally. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I hope within the, the legal profession, um, I, I've had an amazing time here. This has been incredibly fun. So. Um, you know, by definition, I'm not done in the legal world. Uh, I'd like to continue to contribute. I'd like to do some, some other things. Uh, I think in the sort of corporate context, kind of been there, done that. The, I mean, the, the legal corporate context. I'm working, now I'm on the board of a startup, but when you're on the board of a startup, you do a lot of stuff that's not legal, and you know, everybody you, in the startup. Are you referring to, is it this village? And, and no, that's, so that's a philanthropy. That's, a, that's a, um, a charitable organization, and I am on the board of that. 
but I'm on the board of, a, of an AI startup called C3. And, um, and that's a lot of fun. I'm having a great time doing that. Uh, and, and I hope there are other things I'd, I'd love to do. I have some passions in life. Um, eradicating poverty in Africa is just one of them, but there are other things that I'd like to do as well. And I'm in a position now to be able to spend more time doing that and, and also you know, put some money behind what I'm interested in, which is a real privilege. Yeah. It's a good question because some companies have that model. Um, none of the companies that I have worked for, Intel or Apple, uh, have that model, and, and it would be one that I'm not comfortable with. If you're an attorney in the company, you should ultimately report to the general counsel. The reason for that, in part, is because if you are part of a business, P&L, then you're also part of the, uh, the ability of that general manager to either hire up or hire down. And what I worry about is if the company needs to begin to trim and you're a business general manager, you may well decide, you know, I don't actually need five lawyers, I could do with four. That's not a decision that a general manager should make. That's a decision that the general counsel should make. And so I have always insisted and, and have not ever had pushback that, that the lawyers need to be on my payroll. I need to be responsible for their costs and for their training and things like that. All right. I think that's all the time we have. I just want to say thank you so much oh, for joining so us welcome. today and answering everybody's questions. You're so um, welcome. And thank you to you guys for coming today yeah, and for asking for questions. We really yeah. appreciate it.